don't get me wrong, I love the gaming business. I could have chosen to stand by the wayside and let the zeitgeist serve me out the latest trend while passing on the latest Twitter outrage, but instead I'm knee deep in the thick of it, wading through the muck and weighing the rotten discourse to see if there's anything noteworthy to think about. It's a curious yet comfortable space I find myself in. Foreign for a man with a background as randomly assorted as mine. From an overachieving student, dope dealer, blue collar worker, cook, voice actor, business consultant to whatever this is. And yet it's oh so familiar how this industry goes through the exact same motions as country boys posing as street level gangsters, C-suite executives posing as business moguls, and everything else in between. I'm not bitter, I'm built for this. But for your sake, I hope cold takes the only time of the week you get a whiff of the video game industry's dirty laundry. I fear any more than that will cause strange lumps to form and biopsies ain't cheap in this third world country wearing a Gucci belt known as the US of A. It's not good to keep it all inside, so let's have ourselves an aggressive introspection and get it all out. Why are you here? Learning about the unfortunate mishandlings of the hobby you enjoy when there is so much of it to enjoy that you can play all day. All night, all your life really, cradle to grave, without ever hearing about a single layoff, cancellation, or merger gone wrong. Veteran developers, why are you working here, aggravating your IBS, watching your peers lose their jobs and ruining your F5 key refreshing your work email to make sure your access hasn't been revoked yet? Aspiring developers, why are you trying to get into an industry that's going to chew you up and spit you out as well? if it's even still here by the time you begin looking for a job. Why am I here if it's all a lost cause? Because I feel overall things are generally trending upwards. Games can improve post-launch, accessibility is off the charts compared to where we were 10 years prior, and the industry is still able to stand amidst its own presumed crumblings. The goal is not to have no problems, but to be strong enough to overcome them or thoughtful enough to mitigate the worst of it. The one thing I do think has regressed is social media, but we'll see how I feel by the time I get there. But for now, let's talk games. And my heart still sits somewhere around the early 2010s where we had, in my opinion, some of the best original IPs, sequels, and threequels in both the AAA and indie scenes. Yes, I was a COD fanboy and this correlates with my favorite string of releases, but I still played the other games my friends loaned me against my will. Like Dark Souls. If anything, I think that should speak more to the quality of the other games that they could grow an extra taste bud on my one-note palette. And some of these games I'm retroactively working through, like Far Cry 3, still manage to stand out even when played today. Vaz? What a character. The pot-burning mission with Skrillex playing in the background? So much funnier now that it's legal. Couple all of that with the general multiplayer scene of the time, and you got this sense that everyone was there for the moment. If you didn't like a game, you moved on. If you did like a game, you enjoyed it because nothing lasted in those days. We were sharing these experiences together, that is, until the hype beast nation attacked. The culture became less about enjoying what we had and more about looking forward to the next thing and the next thing, until eventually it was a never-ending hype cycle. I think that's an attitude we never got away from and led to a greater emphasis on pre-orders and rushed releases until the chicken kept coming through more and more undercooked. It's a slippery slope. Next thing you know, people are serving medium rare chicken, and then eventually chicken sashimi. And I still remember there were so many people rushing to the refund window for all the smoke No Man's Sky ended up being, that for the first few days, Steam, Amazon, and Sony were giving people their money back regardless of playtime. You'd think a moment like that would have been enough to make people reject hype and pre-orders, but that's like asking people to give up hope and pre-orders. It's the best of the human spirit working against itself. The hype beast cycle and underdeveloped games evolved with the times as we shifted into live service. The games came through buggy and unfinished at worst, bland at best, and managed to attract a crowd that's willing to excuse every problem until the bitter end. Or the sweet payoff. The fact that games can potentially recover or improve after launch cannot be understated. In the 2020s, games can receive more polish, more accessibility, new features, or even rework themselves until they better resemble what was initially advertised after the launch. It's a modern miracle. I'm sure everybody's got a game deep down inside they feel was ever so shy of the mark and could have benefited greatly from post-launch development. For as much as I lament the Star Wars Battlefront re-release again again, it's got a better chance of being more than the originals ever were. 
It could also be less, as in the case of Overwatch 2 being changed into a different game from the original, and now I have no access to the version of the game I initially purchased. Imagine waking up one day and your minivan's got one less seat than it used to. Just put the baby on the roof, I guess. And I have no legal standing either since the TOSs of games, including single player, have added the bit where they warn you anything can change at any time for any reason. In that sense, it feels less like a modern miracle and more of a monkey's paw. But I'm still voting 55-45 in favor of the monkey. I've just severely withdrawn from multiplayer games and live service games in general. And let me take this moment to address the people who think I am anti-live service on principle. I have put in an embarrassing amount of time into online-only ever-evolving live service games when I used to be the target demographic and still do because it's the itch that won't go away from me. I'm not prudish with principle. I am addicted to quality and all I'm saying is the crack was better before you got here. The prices were reasonable, there was less filler, and the dope heads were more discerning than the current clientele going, aw, you're too picky. Maybe it'll get better tomorrow. Is being less destructively addictive really a negative, though? I suppose not, so I come off as the crotchety aging party animal trading in his Molly and Percocet for magnesium tablets and fish oils. Now, if we are fighting over the contents of a game, it tends to be less about the game game and more about the game's monetization. And everyone has different tolerances. Some don't like any sort of monetization beyond the cost of purchase. Others are fine if it doesn't affect gameplay. And others compromise if it affects gameplay but can be overcome with a time investment. But we spend so much time looking at everyone else's nickel and dimes that we don't really take a step back and see how modern monetization has been a major benefit for gamers on a budget. Theoretically, one whale's purchases could be supporting, say, three free-to-play college kids trying to get some stress out in Path of Exile during finals week. If you've always been able to afford the best games and hardware, then you won't notice how mobile gaming, for all its flaws, has spread gaming to countries that traditionally couldn't afford it. And these ain't cheap bootlegs, these are official games from major publishers. Consider Genshin corrupt for its freemium gacha mechanics, but you can play for dozens, if not hundreds of hours without spending a dime on a phone, no less. I ain't necessarily excusing a casino for having a daycare in it. Or is it a daycare with slot machines? I'm just saying there's a conversation to be had here. I used to only play with friends that had an Xbox, then I only played with friends who gamed on PC, and now I can play most games with anyone, regardless of system, because of crossplay. And the crossplay wall wasn't torn out of goodwill, it's because every system wanted a piece of the Fortnite pie. The wallets voted to play with friends, regardless of hardware. Maybe they don't vote for every change you might want, but you can't win them all, I suppose. And that's the theme spilling into everything else. Yes, it's a shame people's livelihoods hang in the balance every quarter. And the silver lining is that I imagine a lot of them will be able to find a better home for their talents while the industry sorts itself out, hopefully with outside regulation. Because it's come a long way since the 1980s when game developers weren't really a thing, just software developers and programmers. In my opinion, I don't think there's going to be a crash, but if there is one, the passionate and the willing have the tools, teachings, and peers it would take to rebuild. So if you're wondering whether it's too late to switch degrees, I say stick with it if it's where the burning desire leads. It's a safer bet than it's ever been. Even circling back to my fondness for the early 2010s, there were major issues that are unheard of now. You could say one bad thing about a game and your videos were taken down by the publisher. Say anything about Nintendo, you'd get a warm fuzzy cease and desist in the mail. Good to know some things never change. The games weren't as regulated. There were hardly any consumer protections. This was not a legitimate job opportunity. Indies weren't as mainstream. Publishers had more power. But a lot of the mess was mopped up by people who dedicated themselves to championing the interest of gamers and fought through very real lawsuits for change. We're so far separated from that now and get to cozily argue over the small things like yellow paint and things that appear to be small things that are hard to convince people are actually big things like game ownership, the psychological aspects of game design, or corporate strategy. The unsexy dregs the average gamer and writer doesn't find appealing, but people like me consider that to be the most concentrated source of flavor. Why else would I be here? It's mostly because I like talking about how the sausage is made and seeing how it resonates with people. Not necessarily for the better or worse, but to see their reactions. Some find it interesting, some dismiss me as a smug know-it-all. Some panic and direct their anger at me at times. I find it all equally fascinating. And it's got the added payoff that maybe I help one or two people decide how they want to navigate the video game industry, or the rest of the world at large. Maybe I can convert a CEO into a more benign tumor. A lipoma is kind of out of the way. Some people give theirs cute pet names. Or maybe I just made an interesting person or two along the way. 
The only downside is constantly being exposed to asinine opinions from people who want to label me their champion or their enemy. If we're being honest here, I'm as disappointing a role model as I am a rival. The only two types of people allowed to exist on any kind of social platform these days. How's that Batman line go again? Either you die a hero, or live long enough for people to yell at you that you're not doing enough to advance their cause, and if you like Pal World, then you're advocating for stealing art from artists, buddy, so you should probably leave. And if you keep living long enough past that, you'll eventually be considered a pompous elitist who doesn't enjoy anything ever, so you should probably leave. Either too unethical or too self-righteous, take your pick. But I think it's got more to do with social media being in possibly the worst state it's ever been as far as user experiences go, and I'm actually extremely fortunate to have so little vitriol directed my way. It's like one in every 1,000 individuals, and it's not even that mean. If I am to be the face of something, I'd like to be the face of sensible curiosity combined with the hedonistic pleasures of gaming. That's what attracted me to this industry, and on the days where I wonder what it's all for, I can take a step back and see how far it's come along. It'd be a shame to stop now, and I have a conveniently strange enough background to help move it along. I'm not a saint fighting for a righteous cause, nor a self-important Anton Ego, but I'll gladly be the Anthony Bourdain of the gaming industry, an insightful scoundrel as human as they come.